the Bend Motorsport Park. It's a brand new adventure. A new track. This entire thing is a giant question mark. Our supercars turned it on for their first ever race here. Supercars erupt at the Bend for the very first time. Yesterday, this driver took out a historic win. Great driver. Taylor Bend, the first supercar winner is Shane Van Gisbergen. Today, a longer race, different challenges. It's all a whole new equation. But the same aim. Starting to look like a very, very serious threat to McLaughlin's championship lead. As the battle for the Virgin Australia Supercars Championship heats up. Good afternoon and welcome to the final day of action from our newest destination on the Virgin Australia Supercars calendar. This is the Ben Motorsport Park, located 100 kilometres southeast of Adelaide in South Australia. This fast flowing technical circuit has been a real challenge. Still plenty of unknowns as we get ready to launch into 200 kilometres of racing here. And it is a very good afternoon to Russell Lingle. Fantastic to be here on the grid as we build up to lights out. And for the seventh time this season, the Rebel Holden Racing Team have locked out the front row of the grid. How is it going to play out between the teammates this afternoon? Because we know, and we saw it yesterday, it's all about pit priority. Oh, you're right, Jess. The excitement is building so much, and especially between these two teammates as well. We spoke to Jamie Winkup earlier, and he was pretty dark on himself that he let Shane Van Gisbergen by. That means he got caught out in the double stack. He won't want that to happen today again. He's going to fight hard for these first half a kilometre down to turn one to make sure he's in the lead he will want pit priority absolutely for sure so don't expect the fight between djr penske and the red bull teams there's going to be an inter-driver fight between triple eight as well it's going to be so exciting but so important this first lap absolutely the championship is on the line here today shane van gisbergen now only 41 points behind scott mcgoggin who starts well back in the order scott's starts haven't necessarily been his strong strong point. So how does he get the perfect one here today and how does he stay in contention for a podium finish? Well, unfortunately for Scott McLaughlin, he's got the two fastest starters in the field on the front row as well. So Scott has to make a great start. This is where their strategy has to play out. They're going to have to make a call. I don't reckon they've got a, so a solid strategy, the DJ Pensy. They're going to have to change it as the race goes on. Scott gets a good start, well then maybe they'll leave him out. If he gets a bad start, pull him in early, get him out of everything because we know he can lap well on his own and try and get the undercut. So, like I said before, these first few laps will dictate what Scott McLaughlin does as far as strategy goes. Well, the grid here at the bend is a hive of activity, so let's get amongst it. Here's Neil Crompton. Hi, Jess. Hi, everybody. Yes, it's very busy down here, and there are a whole lot of people that are out of place relative to those that we've seen figuring very well in the championship so far this year. A couple of overarching observations, though. Just stop and think about where we are, what we're doing, and what this is all about. A $110 million facility, brand new, for the first time in two decades in Australian motorsport, this permanent facility, with five track variations. We're using the international circuit. Enormous number of people around us here. Four-storey building, hospitality, rally cross tracks, drag racing, Superstar drivers, including David Reynolds here as well, who's just wandered up to the back of his car while I was covering. Nice to see you, man, but I'm sure that you're not thrilled with the notion of being 12th on the grid. No, Neil. Um, not the best weekend we've had, but, uh, you know, we made, we made progress in the last qualifying session, but it's probably just a bit too little, too late to get on top of the setup. What's the chase? What have you, you been looking for that you've not been able to nail down? Uh, just because, like, the surf's so new, produces a lot of grip, so the front tyres react a bit quicker than the rear, and it's a lot of turn and overs here. It's a worry for the championship chase. Yeah, it's not the best, but uh, yeah, we'll cross that bridge at the end of the year. <laughs> how, how are you going to play it? I mean, what will you do this afternoon? An extra 80 k's today versus yesterday. Um, so yeah, it just depends on you know who pits in front of me on the first couple of laps, and if I try and pit early and and undercut everyone, or you know, there's not a lot of deg here, so um, you you know you don't really have to change tyres that early in the race. So yeah, we'll see. We'll, yeah, I don't want to give it all all my secrets away, <laughs> but. We'll see what's going to happen. Keep smiling. Thanks, mate. Have a good run this afternoon. David Reynolds in the Penright Holden Commodore. He talked about no deg and the reason, and Mark Larkham's covered a bit of it this weekend. Have a look at the track surface here. It's not only is smooth in terms of bumps, but smooth in terms of the surface and the interaction with the Dunlop hard tyre this weekend. Alongside David, position number 11 on the grid is Andre Heimgartner in the Plus Fitness Entry. Haven't seen a lot of him so far this weekend. Good to catch up. 
Andre, we've seen you there or thereabouts through the weekend. The Nissans have been typically very strong. What's your weekend been like? Um, yesterday was fairly frustrating, just not qualifying where we should have, and then the race always getting shuffled back. So um, today we're there, thereabouts. We, uh, you know, we think we have the race pace, and the last four or five meetings have been a bit of a struggle for me, just um, not not uh, having the best of luck and a few things happening. So um, it'll be good today to try and get a good solid result, and uh, that's what I'm in for. All right, have a good run this afternoon. He's engineer Dylan Talabani just looking over at the back of the car there. A slight variation in the front brake here this weekend as well in preparation for the Pertec Enduro Cup because the brake story is a big one when we get to the endurance part of the year and that's coming up next at Sandown, then Bathurst, then off to the Gold Coast. Peer in here and you can see him. You won't be able to pick it from the outside, but tiny difference in the weight of the disc, a little bit thicker in the cheek and a little bit different in the way it manages temperature. Fabian Coulthard at the back of car number 12, Shell V Power Racing. This is not where we're accustomed to seeing you. You've had your troubles this weekend, unfortunately. Yeah, it's been tough. Um, you know, it's one of those deals that, you know, we've worked hard, you know, as a group to get our cars as close to the front. And the boys have done a fantastic job to get Scotty and I closer to the front, but it's a hell of a lot different than where we're at. Am I detecting a little bit of a man cold? Yeah, I'm sick as a dog. <laughs> okay. Well, there you go. Should we come? Quote of the week. Hey, no, we get away from me. Stay well away. Have a good run this afternoon. Uh, Will Davison, car number 230 for Milwaukee Racing. Next Thursday, it's his birthday. And no, I'm not going to sing happy birthday. He's in conversation here with Rob Nass. Yesterday, got inside the top 10, Wilbur. Uh, I just plugged your birthday during the week. Happy birthday when that comes along. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not counting them anymore. Uh, neither am I. Uh, you're, you're out of the moon boot, but I see you're still limping. Everything OK? Uh, yeah, it's OK. It's a bit cold here. I think the cold weather, it freezes up a bit. I'm feeling about 80, but uh, might need it cleaned up at the end of the season, but it's, it's all right. All right, now, what do you do from here? It's a long way back. Do you do something different with strategy? And it's hard given the low deg. What are you going to do in terms of pit stop strategy? Uh, just try and think on the run, think on your feet. You know, it's, um, it's a standard thing. Do you go aggressive, pit early? Um, or do you stay out? You know, people, you've got to react to everyone around you. So I think the balance can improve uh, to run long, but it's when do you want to do that long stint, start or middle. So um, I actually don't have an answer for you. We're going to literally get to the end of one or two laps and see where we're situated. That's what we love about the game. Go and get them this afternoon. Thanks. Good luck, Will Davison. Uh, Nick Perkat's over here as well. Big weekend for South Australians with a brand new facility here. This man is one of four of them. Don't shake your head when I walk up to you like that. You're supposed to look more positive. Sorry, Ev, I'll just jump in here. Uh, this car's been up and down so far this weekend. What's the story? Um, our qualifying then was just the bloke steering the ship. Uh, kind of went a bit soft at turn six and probably dumped, yeah, close to point eight. So uh, it's not hard to figure out where that would have landed us. So probably third or fourth. So, yeah. That was um, yeah my, my mistake there. Cars were really, really loose through five with the different wind direction. Um, so I went conservative at six and yeah paid the price massively and couldn't make it up for the rest of the lap. But annoying because we had um, the rest of the lap was actually quicker than the, the time I did in practice um, practice three. So all good. Channeling 1996 Lowndes and yeah. Murphy in the old yeah. mobile outfit. New livery on the car this weekend. Have a good run this afternoon, Nick. Good luck in your quest. 200 kilometres around here this afternoon for a big long run. Now one of the other things that I just also wanted to mention because I haven't made a lot of noise about it this weekend, look at the signage over on the fence here, easy as OTR. OTR for those that don't know that are outside South Australia is a big convenience store chain. They've got huge market penetration here, are the title sponsors this weekend. They've been a very big story and that business has invested massively for all of us in motorsport. We're very thankful for the opportunity to come to a brand new facility like this and everybody at the Sheehan family, thank you very much. Hey Frosty, yesterday nice run, today hasn't qualified where you wanted to ultimately end up. What's the story? I uh, just um, got a bit loose today in the, in the quali, but um, it's evolving and, and changing that quickly, the track. So it's new for everyone. And, and you've seen almost a 180 flip with some people who were competitive yesterday who probably had the balance, um, have got oversteer today. And then uh, on the other side, other guys have moved up. So um, except for the Red Bull cars, they were there yesterday and they're still there. But uh, just getting on top of the track conditions, it's new for everyone. And we had one good day yesterday. Hopefully we've tuned it up for the race. It was a bit cooler in quality this morning and uh, there was a bit of extra pace initially, but it looked pretty dirty out there for the back two thirds of that session. Yeah, the, the cars, are when they drop a wheel, bring dirt on the track and um, you go around there blind and you have to commit, it's qualifying and you come through and uh, you kind of cross your fingers and hope there's no dirt on there, but it is what it is. Um, you know, guys got it right, guys didn't, so you can't use it as an excuse. Um, you know, if you're good enough, you would have got it done. So we're, we're 17th for a reason. Go and have fun this afternoon in the Botlo car. Engineer Brendan Hogan with a very pensive look on his face. He's calculating, he's thinking. They are also thinking about this wind direction. Have a look at the Virgin flag up here at the moment. Southwesterly, 20, 25 kilometres an hour, Murph. And if you find yourself in a tailwind at turn one, 
cold track conditions could be a bit exciting down there. Yeah, I think also from the run-up that Richie Stenaway is going to have from back here on the grid, mate. It's a long way down to turn one. It has been a tricky weekend for you, to say the least. We've seen the rabble car off the road a fair few times and qualifying for race uh, 23 hasn't gone very well either. Yeah, it's been a tough weekend for us, so... Um you know, not what we were hoping for, but, um, you know, some of the other guys in our team have showed some good promise uh, this weekend, especially yesterday. Um, but, uh, yeah, just obviously for our entry, we just haven't really been getting it together and, um, and whatnot. We've at least got an opportunity to, to you know, try and make something of a, of a bad uh, starting position. Um, but, yeah, I'm just going to try have a clean one today and um, see what we can get out of it. Yeah, I noticed before there was a fair bit of work going on underneath the bonnet of your car when you came around here, a bit of a misfire going on. Has that all been rectified? Yeah, um, it wasn't quite sure what was wrong with it on the way to the grid here, but um, fortunately it was uh, only a minor mechanical issue that we could fix uh, before the start of the race. So um, it wasn't terminal, which is uh, how it felt on the way to the grid. So it's, uh, it's all fixed up now and ready to go. Thanks, buddy. No worries, thanks. Final day of competition now at Tail and Bend, the OTR Super Sprint, race number 23 of the championship, jumping inside the Hino Hub to condense all the facts and understand what we're about to witness. 41 laps, 200 kilometres around this amazing brand new complex. Here's the fuel scenario today, a very different structure. It's a 120 litre fuel drop and it doesn't go into our tank, so minimum requirement is to stop a couple of times and you can fill up and get home to the final lap from lap number 14 and a new lap record set by Shane Van Gisbergen and also the first man to claim a win at this location. Talking about the location, let's have a look at the hot spots around here because there's plenty of them. We saw qualifying, in fact, influenced by the dirt at turn four and five in particular. We're seeing a lot of trouble at 10, 12, 13 and 18 and corresponding passing spots. There's a good one down at one but hasn't been quite in evidence as much as we've seen at six, certainly on the inside at 13 in the last couple of corners as well. Recapping just exactly what happened yesterday, Shane was the man that got the job done. Really good news for Nissan Motorsport to be able to claim a couple of decent podiums. Fourth for him and the first one in 2018. So nice work for those guys. Now, key considerations for our day. This is very important because the way in which the track is evolving as it begins to rubber up is changing everything. Over here, notice a much cooler day today than yesterday. In fact, right now, you can really feel that southerly breeze and that'll be an influence because there'll be a tailwind into turn one. This is a big deal, trying to manage these mistakes. We saw a ton of them on Friday and a heap of them on Saturday morning. It was pretty calm yesterday. We did ultimately see a safety car, but it wasn't because it was a mistake. It was because of Garth having a drama with that engine. There is no possibility of an undercut because the tyre degradation is so low that there's nothing going on there. Here's your classification and the critical lap, as I said just a couple of moments ago. So a really interesting one, this one. Let's see whether or not Jamie can smarten that car up enough today to be able to keep his team mate behind race number 23 200 kilometers rick kelly awesome day for nissan motorsport yesterday too on the podium how much of, of that was a boost for your team to have quality pace and race pace yeah it was was good my little man lex at home was pretty impressed with us getting a trophy and um we're gonna have my work cut out to get him one today it's a fair way to the front and uh, tracks shifted a lot in um, conditions yesterday today which caught us out here in quality so we've made a couple of changes and hope it stays pretty predictable and we can move forward but who knows are you confident that you're going to have that same race pace that you did uh, yesterday in this afternoon? No, <laughs> not based off quality. We had a great car in quality yesterday and today we fought it um, to ninth and, and we actually had a, a couple of clean laps so we didn't have much to complain about there. So we've made some adjustments to it and just like I say, hope that we've caught up with the track and we can maintain a decent balance with the car and, and move it forward. Make it entertaining for us. Good luck. I'll try. Thanks. Uh, Chad Mostert just tried to auction his drive off and no one took it. No, there was no takers. Nah, nah, I don't want to auction it off. I just wanted to see if there was any takers. But uh, yeah, obviously not where we want to be. But um, hey, got the Craig Lounge spirit in me, you know. Keep the smile on, keep it happening. But um, yeah, look, it's uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And um, I think you've learned to race from back here. So uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, hopefully learning some race craft. Get a ripper start, mate. You'll be right. Thanks very much, mate. It's an extraordinary contrast day to day. What is noticeable out there at the moment is just how breezy it is on that grid relative to yesterday. And I made mention in the grid walk of just how windy it is out there at present. I didn't get a chance to grab Garth Tanner. I wasn't far from him, but uh, 300th event this weekend for Gary Rogers Motorsport. Congratulations to Gary, to Barry, to young James and Garth in that squad, Wilson Security Racing. It's been an amazing innings, beautiful side out there to see these supercars at this racetrack in a moment to pause now to perform the national anthem 
local singer from Talem Bend. Welcome, Darren Gurney. Australians, oh, let us rejoice, for we are young and free. With gold and soil and wealth for toil, our home is girt by sea. Our land abounds in nature's gifts of beauty rich and rare. In history's page, let every stage advance Australia fair. In joyful strains and let us sing, advance Australia fair. We're at the Bend Motorsport Park, 100 kilometres southeast of Adelaide. Nearby Adelaide Hills and wine regions, Tail and Bend home to just under 2,000 people adjacent to the Murray River, right where the Murray meets the ocean on the Melbourne Adelaide Highway. The Bend, formerly the Mitsubishi Test Track and Proving Ground, a four-storey pit building hotel, five circuit variations. There's karting, rallycross, four-wheel drive, trackside villas, a business park, and today the focus is on the 4.95 kilometre racetrack. Thanks to Virgin Australia. Let's check out the details. In the old money, it's about 100 miles an hour as an average speed around this racetrack. 4.95 kilometres, top speed just on 275 to 278 kilometres an hour. A bit of a southerly influencing that this afternoon. Let's look at it in further detail. So just over 500 metres from the front row of the grid to the apex of turn number one. It is a passing opportunity. Really intricate bend at turn two that leads into the positive camber right hand at turn three. Flat through turn four. There's been dirt getting onto the road at turn five. The cars running wide there are throwing the dirt back onto the road. Then a blind brow to the left hand of second gear, turn six. Slowest corner on the racetrack, and then you commence this long right hand run that punishes the left hand side tyres. Culminates in a tightening turn 10 where it's very easy, Mark Scaife, to fall off the road. We did some laps early in the weekend. Grins from ear to ear. There's a lot to enjoy out there. Welcome. Welcome. And it is an interesting place, Neil, isn't it? Because one of the things about it is a lot more rise and fall than you think. It's got roughly 16 metres from the lowest point to the highest point. And that makes some of those blind entries you spoke about difficult to get a marker, difficult to understand how far it falls away from you. And the run onto the straight is one of the trickiest because when you first turn it in, the car tries to slide, try to gather the car up and get it onto the main straight. And yesterday, after the start, Winkup and Van Giersberg and they had a great exchange. He ended up getting down the inside of Winkup and he was very fast. He actually set what was going to be his fastest lap on the last lap. A great drive by Van Giersbergen and got that championship margin right back to 41 points, Neil. It's a big story because his form in the recent past, Shane Van Giersbergen, is a real threat to this man. Scotty McLaughlin is now only 41 points clear of his fellow countrymen. So that margin has been continuing to tighten up and that's going to build a big pressure going into the Pertec Enduro Cup. Neil, I want to talk very quickly about colours. Three colours I want to talk about. The yellow on the side of the Dunlop tyre. That's the harder of our two tyres. Maybe not completely compatible with the surface. The drivers hate it. That is great. The other colour. Look at the colour of the numbers on the side window of the cars. Look at McLaughlin's. It's a different colour. That's the colour of the championship leader. Will it change today? And finally, the colour of the roadway here. Jamie Winkup for pole position. He earned the dirty side of the circuit. And so much of today is going to be about the race between these two guys down to the first corner because if we get a double stack scenario again, might cost Jamie like it did yesterday. Tune in, enjoy. We started the weekend asking a lot of questions. Some of them have been answered. It is a complex track. There are elevation changes. Setting up for it is a real challenge. It's very tricky. 
Formation lap underway. Big crowd on hand at Tail and Bend. Let's have a look at the way in which the drivers will line up for race number 23 of 31, the Virgin Australia Supercars Championship. Triple M starting grid in his fourth Armour All Pole of 2018, Jamie Wincup. Position number one yesterday, Shane Van Gisbergen. He's on a charge. Best qualifying for 2018 for Tim Slade and for Scott Pye, best qualifying since the AGP. Michael Caruso on the podium yesterday and 15 places made by Craig Lowndes. James Courtney, a big charge as well. Di Pasquale fined and docked some points yesterday for his trouble and check out the championship leader alongside the driver who finished second yesterday. Yeah, he did a great job, didn't he? Rick Kelly, superb drive. David Reynolds behind his teammate Anton Di Pasquale and what can Fabian do to help Scott McLaughlin today. Nick Perk had a long way away from his teammate, Will Davison, alongside him there in 16th. Mark Winterbottom, Garth Panda line up 17 and 18. Young Jack LeBrock. Now we've got two extra cars this weekend. Macaulay Jones is one of those, as wildcard entries, and Kurt Kostecki is the other. Simona Di Silvestro lines up alongside Lee Holdsworth, and Chaz Mostert, the worst qualifying of the year for him. In fact, it's his worst qualifying since Bathurst in 2014. James Golding, Kurt Kostecki, Richie Stanaway, who was tangled up with Garth Tander at Armour All Qualifying. Todd Hazelwood this weekend switching from the FGX Ford Falcon back to the car that he won the Dunlop Super 2 Series in last year. We're riding on board the Penride entry. And it gives you an idea of this beautiful layout. 12 metres wide for the majority of the racetrack, 15 metres on the front straight, a track that is built to an international standard for both car and motorcycle racing. The pole sitter, Jamie Wincup. Generated four of those in 2018. Mark Winterbottom, I spoke to him on the grid before, Botlow Racing Team. Good, strong run yesterday. Was very happy with the progress, but the track evolved. Conditions changed. People have been chasing their cars all weekend, and so he wasn't able to convert today. Fabian Coulthard didn't sound well when I caught up with him on the grid yeah, before. Was wasn't he? We've got cars covered in every direction out there at the moment. Cameras left, right and centre on board and around and of course all around the race circuit as well. New livery this weekend for a couple of cars. Michael Caruso is one of those with Industrial Athlete on the car. That's Rick Kelly, Castrol Racing. Nick Perkat got the mobile colours on this weekend. A couple of interesting things to observe because yesterday these guys were really quick, weren't they? James Courtney, very impressive with the way in which he made ground 16 positions in the race and just sliced through the traffic. It was so good that we clipped it up and <laughs> enjoyed it as highlights. So it's not that often in this business where you've got a car that's that superior to the others that you're racing that you get to pick them off like fish in a pond. But he did, <laughs> he and did. it was very strong. Now today, though, it's his teammate, Scott Pye, who did the awesome job in qualifying. He's got the car with the pace on it. There's the pricey of the facts today. 23, race number 23, 41 laps, 200 kilometres. And it is time certain, as always, our critical lap is lap 14. I think, Mark, because of the low tyre degradation, I wouldn't be surprised at all if you're down the order to see people batting for a clear track. So just come in, dispense with the first fuel requirement, and then try and buy yourself at least a clear piece of road this afternoon to ply your trade. Pretty much right, Neil, and I think pretty much from everybody that I've spoken to, you can come in whenever you like. As long as you've got clear track, get on with doing that. Clear track, I think, are the key words. Yep. We're looking at Scott McLaughlin, row five, position 10 for him. 28 cars rolling into position. On the front row of the grid yesterday, Jamie Winkup converted beautifully, led the field into turn one. He was haunted into the first turn by his teammate, Shane Van Gisbergen. And I'd be surprised if he wasn't privately lamenting leaving that gap at turn six only a few laps into the race because when that safety car came out, that proved to be pivotal for Jamie Lincoln. Green flag, we're set for a start, 200 kilometres of racing. The OTR Super Sprint Part 2, Sunday, tail of bed. second position if he can stay there. Wincup leads the bend. It'll be very tight. Oh, and Van Gisbergen was sliding on the outside. He barely hung onto it. Slade gets up the inside of him. Lowndes couldn't close the deal in the end, but it was a great exchange. What a tremendous start by Lowndes around the outside. And young Tim Slade put the car in the perfect spot to get down the inside for turn three. Good move, Tim Slade. Wincup has bolted. And that was because Shane got very sideways through two. 
cold tyres. A southerly breeze pushing the back of the cars as they got down there. Wind Cup didn't fold it. He's bolted, but everybody else got bottled up. And speaking of that, look at them back in the pack. We're riding here with Chas Boston. We were looking at the back of the Corley Jones. What a start by Jamie also. as Kirk Kostecki off the road with a lot of damage to the right-hand rear suspension on that car. That's a failure, and that'll be contact wheel-to-wheel -wheel somewhere. But we spoke about loud start. The one that was superb was Wink Cup. He just jumped. His reaction time was perfect. He had tons of pace by the time they got down to turn one, but nowhere to apply it. There's too much metal in the way down there. Oh, McCauley Jones, very wide at turn 13. He'll drop spots as a result of that. He's McLaughlin. David Reynolds, we're riding on board with him. It was his teammate, Anton Di Pasquale, on the outside, and we're looking at the back of Scotty McLaughlin. So coming up to complete the first lap, already a 1.3 second margin win cup over Slade. Gee, this is a critical time in the race for McLaughlin to make sure that he can get through these early laps without contact. He's actually made oh, two spots. That was a big moment. Who was that? I missed who that was. Yeah, so There's a couple I... coming in, too. There was a bit of madness at the final corner. Now, Courtney's coming together with Rick Kelly, joined by Cam Waters, Chas Mostert, Lee Holdsworth, Simone Di Silvestro, Tabiara in the pit lane. Golding, LeBrock, Blanchard also in as Lowndes has a oh. Michael Caruso. He drops the left rear off the edge of the curbing. Holdsworth in the Preston higher entry. Got Jason Bright in the squad for the Pertec Enduro Cup. He's oh, watching in the garage. Still got a clear pit lane to go. Still clear. Go, go, go. Courtney Kelly, Waters, Mostert, Holdsworth, Di Silvestro, Golding, LeBrock, Blanchard. So a bunch of cars in at the end of lap one. And now up on the inside of turn six goes Shane Van Gisbergen. Tim gave him space. He's got the ideal line on the run through eight, nine and ten, but he looks a bit vulnerable right now. This is yesterday's race winner that we're riding with. He looked like he was going to get him, didn't he, Shane? Couldn't quite get it stopped. As you said before, there's a lot of corners that tend to roll away from you. The entry to turn six is one of those, so he couldn't quite get it stopped to get the front of the car in, which made it all the more important for Tim Slade to finally make that apex and drive away from Shane. Good battle. Wind Cup's got really good speed. In fact, he's done the fastest first sector of the race so far. I want to know what happened with Lowndes coming onto the straight back there. I don't know what the ugliness was. There was something unfolding. We'll probably uh, tidy that up after we see whether this resolves one way or the other. Meantime, Kirk Kostecki's actually parked that car in the garage beneath our commentary box point. So he did get the car safely back. Here oh. goes Shane. Oh. Down the inside. Good move. Of Tim Slade. And connects the dots. Makes that work. And that moves him up a spot. So we've now got Red Bull 1 and 2. And that was cleanly done at turn 17 by Van Gisbergen. I was thinking Good that if he couldn't mate. get by, that if he couldn't get by, it should have pitted him. Because from third then behind Slade, probably makes sense. But now he's made the move, he'll get on with it. And what will also be important here is determining his pace versus wing cups. Under investigation for an unsafe pit release is Simona Di Silvestro and the Team Harvey Norman entry. That's Kirk Kostecki's car. And it's done pretty significant right rear damage. That'll take quite some time to resolve. And that's assuming that they've got all the necessary componentry on hand. Wind Cup's got 2.7 seconds early in the game. That's a big margin over Shane Van Gisbergen. Meantime, Scott Pye torturing the back of Michael Caruso at the moment. These fellas are in a battle for fifth and sixth. Caruso, in fact, has just passed Scott Pye the reason why we picked it up. So once again, the Nissan looking pretty tidy around here. Yesterday, Michael got onto the podium together with Rick Kelly, but his teammate is down in 21st position in the Castrol entry. Here's the replay of the start. Watch Lowndes. Wind Cup converts beautifully. He should be drag racing for a living the way he's getting off the line at the moment. He's doing an awesome job. And Lowndes was super quick on row three. And he pulls to the left-hand side of the road, right-hand side of our screen. And I thought that with the momentum he had, he might have been able to turn that into a position two, but it didn't quite work out because Shane had to wriggle around to the centre of the road because of the positioning of Tim Slade. And then Shane barely got a turn on the exit of one, which made turn two even tighter for him. On board the uh, Wilson Security GRM Holden Commodore. Garth Tander. He's made quite a lot of ground early. He's up seven spots, and this is the reason for why. 
you around the outside of everybody. This is a James Courtney move from yesterday. Gets a little bump there from Heimgartner. Was able to get clear of Coulthard. No contact there in the three. That's a good job by Garth. And this is on board with Lowndes that Neil and I were raving about. How's this? And I was with you. I reckon he had enough momentum there. I thought he was going to outbreak. But just at the end of the straight, before he actually braked, he wasn't any faster. Here comes McLaughlin. He was up three spots. Craig had to go the long way around now. High gun has got, I think, damage on the front of that car. Scott McLaughlin, championship leader in. They're looking for fresh air. Ooh, a lot, a lot of damage. damage. He'll be back to see an apex with that bonnet up like it is. So... First amount of fuel delivered to car number 17 to Scott McLaughlin. We'll get an understanding on that for you as quickly as we can. I don't think it was a huge amount of fuel, frankly. I think it was around about the 30-odd litre mark. And so that, that's for position there, Neil. So that was Scotty Pye. That car's got so damaged that you can't... I reckon he's hit the back of that car on the way out of the pit just then. So that was already damaged. It's hit harder in pit lane. Wow. And that's then put, forced that all back onto the wheel. Well, it looked second-hand when we took a shot of it in the lane. It looked even worse after this. Well, that's the first bit. That's the first bit. So that's where the damage was that you picked up on immediately, but it gets worse. So Tanda was re-entering. Hopefully we'll catch this at some stage, but it's, pre it's pretty bad. Yeah, look at it. You don't have to come in. That's uh, that was was a lot of damage. Close right there. It was massive. massive, wasn't it? Yeah. So, sorry, I was getting back to the position because Scott Pye... Uh, in comes Van Gisbergen. Uh, he's Van Gisbergen, yes. Yeah, so this is important. I think this is showing you can pretty much stop whenever you like, folks. So this is a great race when you can have that. So this is the exit that we want to focus on. So at Nissan, they tried to do a quick patch-up job on the bonnet. And then... And bang! Twice. Wow. Here's Shane in for his first stop of the day. But the worst of it was done on the arrival. So it's interesting, guys, just down watching this stop now, we've seen quite a few cars today putting four tyres. Oh, gee, that was a bad getaway. And again, and again, very cool. Um, we saw yesterday lots of two tyres going on cars. Today I've seen everyone either use no tyres or four tyres because what we said, or Neil has said, no degradation, but what you can't do is upset the balance of the car. Balance, front to rear grip, that is the issue here. And yeah, we were wondering about the whole two versus four thing. We saw a bit of variation up and down the lane yesterday with that. Some were changing down one side, some were doing across the rear, others were doing all four. I think the lesson that we learned from that in overarching terms yesterday was that four's the go or don't touch them because they're actually not wearing. In fact, the way in which some cars got so fast at the very end of the run suggested that they were happier tyres at the very end of the sequence for temperature and pressure. There's, there's an argument that says leave where they are. Yeah, exactly. And out of all that, the little undercut, we've, we've spoken about whether the undercut or the overcut would work, the slight undercut has worked here. It's about a second game for McLaughlin versus Van Gisbergen. New tyre still gives you the game, but here we're not seeing anything like the normal margins that we typically see. So replay of some of that early action off the start. This might explain what happened to Kostecki. It does. So it's just an awkward trip over. He's just interlocked wheels somewhere. Can't even work out who's done what to who here. Uh, so it's Stanaway, one of the GRM cars. And then he ends up running wide on the run down towards turn eight. Plucks the right rear suspension off that car. So they've got that car back in the garage at the moment. They're working on it. And they've also brought Andre Heimka uh, Heimgartner's car back in as well. Coulthard's in. Oh, Simona. So she's ended up making contact and then having to pull back into the transit lane, flick back in behind into the fast lane. Here's all the damage on the front of Andre Heimgartner's car. That closing rate. And the first incident that you picked up on coming into the pit was as hard as I've seen on pit entry for a long time. So that's Fabian Coulthard now being serviced. And here's the battle. So 97 just has moved away a little bit on Scott McLaughlin on that lap. And, and Shane might get a little bit of nutrition out of that undercut because he's just done the fastest lap of the race. He was the lap record holder. 
He's now just done the quickest lap, 1 minute 51.4. He's in 14th position, the first car in the queue that stopped Van Gisbergen. He's currently 14th, and uh, that will eke out a little bit of the gap that he's got, that he's given away to Jamie Winkup, just a bit. Yes, it, it does, but Winkup also did a, a 51.5 on the previous lap. There's not much in it. Oh, this is the lounge story. Here we go. So Lowndes goes across to the inside. He gets a bump. So is that Pi? Yeah. yeah, it's Pi. Pi gives him a serve, and then Caruso ends up being the beneficiary. So we're trying to work that out. Thanks, guys, for getting that together. Well, I saw it in the distance, but I couldn't work out who the perpetrators were. But it started out with Craig literally crossing from the left to the right side of the road, and then Scott Pi needed to force the issue. Work at Nissan Motorsport. Meantime, a battle here involving James Courtney and Scott McLaughlin. And that battle, sorry, Neil, that battle is actually for position because, remember, Courtney started in front of McLaughlin, so that pit stop and pace has got him a spot. Craig Lowndes in the auto barn entry. Stanaway's also in the background. On the last lap, Lowndes did the fastest first sector. Cup's got 3.99 seconds. In fact, I'm going to call it four. Uh, over Tim Slade with Michael Caruso in third, followed by Scott Pye. Oh, here we go. Pit lane penalty for Simona Di Silvestro. An unsafe pit release. An unsafe pit release. So that's not good news for Team Harvey Norman. Let's get back into the lane because I know that Larko was down there with some pit stops. Yeah, well, it's just interesting. When you look at this round of stops, and we've seen four tyres go on again, but the amount of fuel you've got to put in, we know, is 120 litres. So that means if you're not going to carry any extra fuel at the end, you're going to have to stop before about lap 10, right? And uh, what we've seen, Scape, you said about the undercut, it's only a second. Normally, we would see a lot more, but what we're seeing at this circuit, which we don't see a lot at other circuits, is the compounding effect of filling your car off or putting fuel in your car and slowing your car down. I think the car's going to be very quick at the end of the day, but it means we're losing out on that undercut advantage. Thanks, Larko. Yes. So, uh, 37 litres on our reckoning went into Craig Lowndes' car. And confirming you said all four tyres went on that car, Larko. So, 1 minute 51 flat now for Van Gisbergen. So, he's further moved the lap record speed. So, about 20 litres difference between McLaughlin's fill and Van Gisbergen's fill. In which direction? So, under fill for McLaughlin has got him the track position that we spoke of. But roughly so, 28 plays 45. So, Ludo's just trying to get him, couple up. him up the queue, get him in touch with these guys, and then hope that there might be some safety car intervention or something else that gives them a free kick later in the day. Todd Hazelwood's just come into the pit lane as well. Uh, Nick Percat in sector three has just done the best time of the afternoon. Lowndes is looking really racy here. He's got better pace than Ben Gisbergen. Ooh, big slide. Gee, it's knife edge. The way that the tyre works on this surface has created a really fine line of grip threshold. And you just heard the tyres protesting as it slid in behind Van Gisberg and he had to gather it up very quickly. Nice save by Lowndes. He rushed at turn one a bit there and he did pay a little price off the exit. But he's right in the draft, car number 97 at the moment, Craig Lowndes. So these guys at the moment sitting 11th and 12th on the road and Shane is the first car that's actually had a stop. And the overall margin from the race leader win cup to Van Gisberg and is 50 seconds now it's about a 35 second transition plus your fuel and tires and then you can elect how much fuel you want to bring on knowing that you've got to put in 120 litres today so that's a little variable that you can play with to hold your track position but when you're Rob Peter you've got to pay Paul somewhere down the road there's an offset that's right and in terms of car pace folks Ben Gisbergen's come in and put the fresh tyre on he's done a 51.01 for the fastest lap of the race so far Jamie Winkup on the previous lap did a 51.08. So only seven hundredths of a second slower on the last lap with the tyres that have been on the car now for the eight laps. So the drama that we saw at turn seven on the opening lap that involved Kostecki, also Richie Stanaway and James Golding. Uh, there's no further action that's going to be taken as a result. So all drivers have been cleared from that incident. Scott Pye is the car that we're looking at, car number two. 
good stop. It's interesting that most aren't putting a big pile of fuel on, are they? Yeah. That is, um, certainly of those in the front third of the field, they're not sitting still for too long. So it means that they're doing it based on trying to maintain a certain track position. They can see on their computer predictions where they'll drop out when they put the car back on the road and who they'll be racing. And Van Gisbergen critically gets down the inside of Scott Pye, who will want to fight. Oh. And in fact, oh, oh, runs wide. So Shane made sure that he finished him off. And Scott was doing everything he could to not end up losing that position. If you have a look at the number, Pye put 29 litres in. I reckon they timed that stop to put him in front of Van Gisbergen. Didn't quite work. Didn't quite work. And, uh, Look at the amount of dirt down there at five at the moment. Again, when people have run wide with that southerly blowing, it's just bringing it back onto the racetrack. So Lowndes now split by Scott Pye, who's got a fresh tyre on, so he'll get a little benefit out of that tyre momentarily, and that's what he's applying right now. He's searching high and low for a way around Shane Van Gisbergen. Scotty Pye, South Australian, who's had his first win this year at Albert Park at the Melbourne Grand Prix and that tremendous drive basically in the night time on a wet circuit kept Jamie Winkup at bay to get his first win. He's flashing the lights down to Van Gisbergen. So a little bit of cheekiness there from young Scott. I reckon if there's a bloke in the field that won't respond to that, it's probably him. But it'd be Shane Van Gisbergen. <laughs> in fact, I reckon it almost have the opposite effect. So he's got pace at the moment, Pye, with a brand new tyre on the car. So this is actually full colour example of what happens when you've got a tiny bit more rubber. Shane was awake up there for Scott's mood. They can't get too crazy, these two, and they'll both get sliced and diced by Craig Lowndes. That's right. And it'll only be maybe one and a half, two laps at the most, but Scott's advantage will start to dissipate, start to go away when the tyres being used a bit more. So if he can't get him in the next lap or lap and a half, then Gisbergen will be able to settle into a groove. Now the pace, the fastest lap of the race, Jamie Winkup on the last lap, a 50.87. So that's showing you that you can just drive the tyre as hard as you can possibly drive it. Yes, so further evidence that there's no need, to, going. Yeah, no need to rush at plucking those off the hubs. So you just spoke about the fact that it's diminishing returns with a brand new tyre, and we're now beginning to just see that. So Shane's not quite under the same level of pressure that he was just four odd kilometres ago. So the car weight is changing to the tune of just a little over three kilos a lap. Um, you talked, or in fact Mark Larkin talked a little bit earlier about this as an effect on this racetrack. It does have an effect, and so if you think about five laps or ten laps, a substantial amount of weight in the car. They're not quite as sensitive to it as they once were the older generation car when the fuel cell was further rearward in the car, but it's still weight. You've got to accelerate it, you've got to brake it, you've got to turn it, and any time you carry weight in a race car, there is a penalty mathematically. Slade, Caruso and Reynolds in. Change to the back of Tim Slade's car. That's a ride height adjustment on the car 14 for Tim Slade. Van Gisbergen has done the fastest first sector on that last lap. He's in sector three at the moment. Uh, Michael departs. So the order is still wind cup from Davison, followed by Nick Percat, then Mark Winterbottom. We've only got four cars in the field back to Frosty that have not yet stopped. So this. Uh, What's Caruso? Now, how much fuel did they put in 23? Yeah, that's what I was just looking for, exactly. Uh, much, I would suggest. 24. Wincup's going to come in. I reckon he's going to come in this lap. He's got to Shane Van Gisbergen. He's got 52 seconds. 51.8. Oh, big slide. Almost off the road there. That would have cost him a little bit of time. Yeah. Oh, it's right out sideways. He's trying hard. And that's all a pickup on the tyre as well. 50.7, a new lap record for Shane Van Gisbergen. So there's some fast times being exchanged out there at the moment. And uh, 24 litres, the answer to my own question for Michael Caruso. So not very much, but that puts him at the top of the queue of those that have stopped. So that was strategic, but it means he will stand still for a fairly Ooh. lengthy period of time. How's that for an that arrival? Was late. 
everyone was saying you couldn't get past that little hatch line before you had to break. He was well past that then. That's the latest I've seen anybody get on the brake pedal there and be able to pull it up. So this is an intriguing battle because one of the great things, folks, the way the tyre works on this surface, you can basically drive the car as fast as you can all day. There's no tyre conservation required. They do not degrade. Nice and smooth. So this is everybody now. Wincup, Davis and Percat, Winterbottom. That ticks everybody for their first stop. But there's a big variance in fuel load. And Wincup's going to get out in front of Caruso. There's Van Gisbergen in the background, followed by Scott Pye and Craig Lowndes. But big difference on who took on what fuel-wise. So they put 46 litres in Wincup's car. So 24 litres went into this car with Michael Caruso. So on correction, Jamie in a much better position than Michael, but Michael's got track position too. They timed that perfectly, didn't they? Yep. Timed it absolutely perfectly. They put as much fuel in as they could without losing the lead. And that's not an accident. So they've got all of that data at their fingertips, and that's what that engineering group will be doing down there at Red Bull. Andre Hangana, unfortunately you find yourself in the garage after a couple of awkward moments. They just explained to us from your point of view what happened. Um, yeah, I sort of just arrived in the pit lane and there was a car, obviously, you know, Garth was doing his thing and, um, and then I was arriving at a much higher speed, obviously, and just couldn't stop it in time um, and it hit the back of him. So, it was, uh, as you see on the replay, it was just one of those things. It was a bit slipperier than what I, what I imagined and uh, caught me out by surprise a little bit. And then again, just on the exit from your pit stop, what happened there? Um, oh, he just went in front of me and uh, cut me off. <laughs> like, tried to cut me off, but um, it is what it is. Um, you know, hopefully he has a good race and I didn't uh, pit on him too much, but uh, yeah, not the result we wanted. Appreciate your honest thoughts. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Nick Perkett's just done the fastest middle sector on the racetrack, 33-1. Uh, he's sitting up in 10th now. So the refreshed order, you can see it on the left-hand side of screen. Wincup, Caruso, Van Gisbergen, Pye, Lowndes, Reynolds, Slade, McLaughlin, Courtney and Perkett. But there's a little further truth behind all that, depending on who did what and how much Shell Racing fuel they, fuel they gulped or not. <laughs> well, there's a massive disparity. See how I threw that to you? You did. So someone like a Scott Pye, who put 29 in, or Caruso, who put 24 in, they play someone like a Winterbottom who put 81 in. So there's a massive difference. In the middle of all that, someone like a Winkup put 46 in and Van Giersbergen put 40 in. Here comes Fabian Coulthard down the inside of Cam Waters. He can sound good on the grid, Fabian Coulthard, and that'll be part of the discomfort that he's experiencing this weekend. But also just got a battle on his hands from a car setup standpoint. Uh, car number 35 is also being reported by Cam's race control at the moment as having no brake lights. And if that's the case, they'll end up giving it a mechanical black flag and have to bring it in and resolve that problem. So I'll keep an eye on the big mate entry. Here we are with Michael Caruso, replay, looking over his right shoulder with Jamie Winkup in the foreground. Now, you know, in life, oh, monster moment. He gathered it up. He's lost a huge amount of ground. He may lose another spot. Watch for another car coming by here. There you go. That was one. Two of them, in fact. Two. So that was turn 18. So Van Gisbergen and Pi get a free kick for their trouble. And that's what happens when you have a poor corner exit speed. So for Shane and for Scott, that was easy meat. Just got the dirt off there, Van Gisbergen. He's very, he's got a very high racing IQ. Something like that happens. He works it out very quickly and he tries to organize himself to optimize the performance all the time. This is on board now with Craig, so he's right up in behind Caruso after that mistake. I just wanted, uh, we looked at this on Friday, just the difference between what we usually see at a lot of these racetracks. If you look at the stuff on my hand here, it's like filings of rubber that's come off these tyres, rather than the balling of the tyre or the rubber that comes off at most other circuits, just highlighting how smooth this racetrack is. And I just want to have a look, just quickly show you, I'll throw that away. Just again, and uh, Larko yesterday was highlighting this, just how good looking these tyres are in great condition. And also I just wanted to point out, look at this, this is run down the pit lane, you can see the camber, how much of the tyres 
just not touching the road based on when the, the tyre is stood up on the car. And it's running down slowly. You can see how much of the tyre is actually dirty. The rest of it hasn't been touching the road when it's been in the lane at all. Very, very different to what we're used to to all the other circuits that we travel to. Um, will this change over the years? Maybe, maybe not. But uh, at the moment, this is uh, very, very difficult to look at. It's a bit of a rarity, isn't it? Thanks for the update, Greg. They're certainly in good condition. I'll be curious to see what they're like when they take them to other tracks and use them in practice as to whether they recycle again with good pace in them. But we invented new terminology this weekend for good looking tyres. Well, Laka calls them gorgeous. Yeah. Well, he they, said they're beautiful. But they have long eyelashes. Oh, no, I'm not sure. I mean, Jess said a little while ago he needs to get out a little bit more with our locker. No, that's no question about that. But that's got nothing to do with tyres. <laughs> Very true. Now, Phil, I've been doing some numbers. So, Wind Cup took on 46. He'll be down there grimacing. Uh, Van Gisbergen took on 40 litres. Pi took on 29. Caruso took on 24. Fifth on the road at the moment is Craig Lowndes, and he took on 37. So I just wanted to give everybody a bit of an understanding. They're on our dead reckoning numbers, not looking at the sight gauges. And that's according to the math. So of those out there at the moment in the top five, the reality is, and this should come as no surprise because he had time in hand because he was leading the race with the cushion, Jamie Winkup is the best position. He's got the fastest car, and he's also got fuel in hand. That's the key message. Yeah. So fastest lap of the race on the previous lap for Jamie Winkup, 50.67. Have a look at the damage on the back of Garth Tander's car. As Lee Holdsworth sneaks down the inside of Tim Blanchard. As you said, you're looking at that graphic battle pack. It's a battle pack, all right. Tim looks like he's going to sneak down there. He does. Nice move. Having to position the car in on the clean line. Lee just had to move the car back in behind him. So, Winkup, Van Gisberg, and Pye, Caruso, Lowndes, Reynolds, Slade, McLaughlin, Courtney, Percat. Of the movers and shakers, Slade's dropped four, Reynolds has come up six, Percat up five, McLaughlin up two, and Mostert up ten. So, that's a handsome recovery. So, he's up in the 15th position now. We're looking at Nick Perkett. He's battling away behind James Courtney at the moment. These fellas are ninth and 10th in the field. So between first and second at the moment, there's six litres of fuel difference. So uh, near enough to a couple of seconds. And 4.6 seconds on track. So as I said before, he's got the quickest car, he's got fuel in hand, and he's got a cushion. So with those advantages up his sleeve and for that group in there, not only did they fuel the car in order to position it back out in front of the field in just the right spot, but uh, they can afford to sit still a little longer and just grab a bit more fuel, knowing today that the rules require that you've got to drop 120 litres of shell racing fuel into the cars. Weird weekend. I asked yeah. him that question on the grid earlier on because he's been up and down. His teammate Tim Slade did an awesome job in qualifying. But, uh, a couple of the practice sessions, Nick was really in amongst it. But what we're also learning is uh, now Courtney comes in. Remember, we've reached critical lap as well. So they're filling up to get home from here. Wow. And uh, yeah, it's got a long way, isn't it? But uh, the tyres are doing nothing, so he might as well put the rest of the fuel in. Yeah, have a, again, I reckon the really cool thing about today is, the you know, we never say this, the tyres don't wear out, they're not degrading, and you can drive the car as fast as you can drive it the whole time. You can pretty much stop whenever you like. We've got about 27 seconds worth of fuel. Track position's the key. Okay, we just hit 10 seconds now. Courtney doing the same thing, so... We're just doing a rear right line adjustment. Tanda also coming in. Okay, you're at... So that's 100 odd litres. The only thing this does and hurts yeah. is you drive the car with a very, fat. very high level of fuel for a fair while. Yeah, so, so when you drive them fat like that, it's not a very nice PC way of describing them, Neil, but it's a it's a, <laughs> it's a car that's going to feel very lethargic. It's gonna feel that you don't accelerate it hard enough, it doesn't stop well enough, it doesn't turn well enough because you've got a lot of fuel on for this part of the stint. Yeah, so with um, 101 odd litres, oh, 
birthday. Do you realise it's... Uh, I'm sure we just went the wrong way. Keep talking, about Mark, 70, while I about 75. <laughs> Seven, I'm looking for the specific gravity. It's yeah. about 79 kilos of fuel. <laughs> More on the calculator. Yeah, so I'm going to call it 80 for simplicity because I'm a simple creature. 80 kilos of fuel makes for another passenger in the car, effectively. We're on board here with Chaz, who slowly but surely sneaks up the inside. He thought long and hard about whether he could make that one work. Pies also just come in together with McLaughlin and Lowndes. So uh, they're just ticking the critical box, critical lap box, I beg your pardon, and just getting fuel on now and getting home. And uh, about 94 litres have got to go into Scott Pye's car. He's got a bit of an issue. He's got an alarm on his steering wheel that will not reset, which is giving him a bit of an annoyance. But it's just an electrical gremlin, nothing to be concerned with. And I just spoke to George Commons, uh, the, fifth, uh, the engineer for number 15, Rick Kelly. He has an issue with his gear shift. It's costing him a heap of time and might explain why he's dropped back down through the field a little bit from where he started. In and done. Lowndes, McLaughlin in there as well. This is McLaughlin. Wind Cup's got 5.3 over yeah, Van Gisbergen. Five seconds to go here, mate. Tires have done through a little These guys are just in search of fresh air at the moment with car 17. So you can see where Scott's going to come out. So that's Simona out of sequence, just rounding up Craig Lowndes. And then Michael Caruso just tucked in behind. So that put uh, Scott McLaughlin just in front of, was that James Courtney in the background? I think it was. Yes, yeah. And it certainly hurt Lowndes because he's come out with cars all around him. Yeah. Garth Tander, replay here. Let's see what happens. It's been a pretty tricky weekend for him so far. Oh, so uh, what the story is. The, the power saw down there to do a quick arrow mod on the <laughs> skirt on the rear bumper. <laughs> it's not your normal aero mod, is it? No. Hey. Sorry about that. Uh, just want to dive in right now and show you a little bit about where we are on fuel strategy, because this is a different race. As the boys have been saying, it's not about tyres today, it's actually about fuel. Now, we know you need 160-odd litres to do this whole race. We know compulsory, you've got to drop 120 into the car. So, logically, that says you're going to start around 40 litres, right? That's how it adds up. Now, first pit stop, we saw if I average the field, most of them come in before 10. Most of them, as an average, put about 40 litres. Now, if we go to the second pit stop, and I put up the critical lap number, which was back at 14, so we've gone past that. Now, we're already seeing teams fill up, put the required amount in. Now, you can see my little green marker up there, and I can sort of show you how much you've got to put in. When that goes green, we know we've got enough in. So about 80 litres. Now, what's odd? If I grab a tyre and bring it out here, normally you'd say a tyre there, too far, can't do it. But this circuit, instead of the tyre degrading in line with the fuel, our tyre here is actually doing something like this, just dropping off a little bit, then it's going to plateau all the way to the end. So the race still is going to be very much at the end, but it's not going to be about tyres, it's not going to be about fuel. I still think it's going to be getting to the end of this race without making a mistake. Risk mitigation and managing mistakes is probably the biggest part of the story. We mentioned that in the Nino Hub. Jack LeBron tangled up yesterday at Turn 1 in that incident with Anton Di Pasquale. One of the other reasons we haven't discussed in great detail for them coming in and just fueling up from Pretty Gulap, though they do go out with a heavy car. Just talking to Mark Scape about it while Mark Larkin was just doing uh, that little explanation down in the Hino Hub. A little bit of it is just hoping that if there is a safety car, they just march up through the field. But um, yesterday we did get one, but not because of a mistake. It was because of a mechanical drama for Gal Tander's car. But hoping there'll be a safety car is a little bit like me hoping I'll win Lotto. And you might, but you might not. <laughs> That's right. It did work for Lounge yesterday. But again, it's a bit of an ad hoc strategy. And it only works if you've got clear track. So we'll get a little gauge soon as to what this has really done for the battle here because these guys have been together pretty much the whole day. Caruso's right in behind Craig Lowndes. Now, you know in life, Coppo, sometimes there's a sponsor coming along and it just sort of tends to fit the mould. I can't think of a better one in a long time. Industrial athlete for Michael Caruso. He's a 
blowfly in a bottle, isn't he? He's a busy boy inside that car. <laughs> His dad's at the racetrack this weekend as well. There's no doubting his commitment. The race he had with his own teammate yesterday, Rick Kelly, that was vigorous. And that's a tidy way of describing it. <laughs> 4.8seconds is the gap between the teammates at Red Bull Windcup over Van Gisbergen. 11 seconds is the total margin back to David Reynolds, who... Uh, has done the single stop so far. I'm just looking at how much fuel they put on to David's car, 46 litres, so a reasonable gulp. So that actually plays him into a decent position yeah, later in the day. Yeah. Um, you can always tell when David's feeling the pain because you can see it in his eyes on the grid in the conversation pre-race. But uh, he and Alistair McVeigh have done a nice job of just sneaking that car along. So obviously they threw, in David's words, uh, to me, a whole bunch of things at it going into the race. Looks like it's working pretty well. There he is in the foreground, kind of a nine. He's got Tim Slade right behind him. Percat, by the way, has just done a new fastest lap, which becomes a lap record here. One minute, 50.6. Have a look at just how hard the tyre and the suspension work works on these cars. Uh, looking at the Freightliner racing entry here of Tim Slade, South Australian boy, in terms of his origin. And uh, I find the distortion of the tyre a very interesting thing. I notice that they've also... Uh, managed to cover up more of the, these bits and pieces on this car from I think yesterday when we saw some images or it might have been Friday in practice. So we're seeing uh, lower wishbone and anti-roll bar mechanism there as well. This is down at turn 10. A few bumps down there in that location on the racetrack and then there's a ripple strip coming up here on the left at 11. Just kisses it gives you a good illustration of what camp is all about here as well so when that tire is loaded up it puts most of its footprint on the ground but in a straight line there's a very large chunk of the tire just sitting up in the fresh air the reason for the camber is to be able to cope with that tire distortion now we jump on board with Shane Van Gisbergen he's second at the moment he's just done a personal best lap there's only one 100th slower than his teammate Jamie Wincup yeah, which means both guys getting the most out of those cars and they're extremely equal and the best lap in the entire race Nick Perkat and he's only three 100s quicker than these guys at the front just goes to show how tight it is out there at the moment but what they have in hand at Red Bull is a bit of space so Van Gisbergen in now for stop number two That was a nice entry there from Shane. He got out of the corner nice and cleanly, got it all straight, was able to break it straight to avoid any of the issues that we saw earlier. And remember, he's got about 80 litres to put in, 21 seconds of fuel for Shane Van Gisbergen. They all said in no changes by the looks of it. Swings in, look for the marks. Right on the marks, guys. A bit of damage on the back of uh, the 97 here too on that rear bumper. He's been touched up a few times. Nice and clean. Tear off coming off. No? Uh, yes. On the front of it. Engages the gear. This is going to be a close rejoin, Murph, with Scotty Pye, I think. He was slow away again, guys. You see that? So the... Lee Holsworth's pulling over on the inside of the track there, actually down the front straight, but he was slow away again. Remember when Larko was commenting on the stop previously, uh, the 97 nearly stalled going away from his last stop, so two slow getaways. Lee Holsworth's pulled over, off well off the racetrack. I was just about to say this might be that safety car. Garth that, Tandem moment from yesterday. But uh, he's yeah. pulled it right into the centre of the racetrack, so that won't be a factor, but that might have been the moment that several of them were looking for. So that's the second stop done for Van Gisberg and back out on the racetrack into eighth position behind McCauley Jones in front of Todd Hazelwood. Richard Stanaway's mixed up here with Michael Caruso as well. Uh, when Caruso does his second stop, he's got to bring on a pretty large chunk of fuel, 96 litres. But when Wind Cup comes in, it's about 74. When High comes in, it's about 91. Nice pass. Yeah, good job, but it's not oh, over yet. You think I... Spoke a little too soon. Well, it puts him on the high side when they get down here to eight, so that becomes problematic. So there'll be some muttering inside Michael Caruso's helmet. Because he can't get too wide down there through that part of the track at eight, nine, and ten. They are fighting for position, so there's uh, 
no compulsion for Richie to have a sidestep, but they're in different fuel sequences at the moment. So Michael, who was right in behind Lowndes, is now five or six car lengths away from Lowndes based on that battle with Richie Stanaway. Just trying to just sneak the front of that car down the inside into the next one. Now, we're on board. I think we've... This is uh, Courtney, I think. Wow, big moment there from McLaughlin. Right out sideways. And he's down the inside. He's had a little bump. Giving him a little escort. And that move changed up into position 16. So McLaughlin's only one spot in front of Mostert now. So 17, that is car 17, is in position 17. So we pick up Jamie Winkup. 11 second margin over David Reynolds. There they are on the left hand side of screen. Stay out was the word from David Couchy because he's showing great pace at the moment. Tim Slade's just done a personal best of 51-1 in third position on the last lap. So quite a few of them have done their second stop. Roughly two thirds of the field. There's a bit of junk on the side of the road there as well. That's on the pit straight. That's probably the Lee Holdsworth remnants down the inside of the road there, do you wow. think? Yeah, that's, that's evil. Looks like it. Looks like it's a, looked like a, was it a drive shaft or a rear sway bar? No, it was a, a, a uh, drive shaft, was it? No, I reckon it was a drive, drive shaft. Yeah, I didn't really see it properly. I, saw, I, did, I didn't focus carefully on the spline on the end of it, but I think oh. it was. Um, now, what's important is the pace of Wing Cup versus Van Giersbergen now. So, corrected for us, Wing Cup, who put 46 litres in, it's only one second difference between what we think is going to be the exit for Wink Cup and Van Giersbergen. So Shane will be pressing on hard. And, and that's part of the reason why Jamie had the full hustle going into the pit lane and that, that in lap, he needed a quali lap yep. as well. So stay out was the word that we heard before from David Couch. And Mark Winterbottom's just moved up the spot because Will Davison has just come into the pit lane for his second stop now. So here we go. Sector splits are key here. So a big lap required from Jamie Wincup to protect that lead. It's going to be very tight between the teammates here. But a nice recovery so far at Erebus in the Penrite car for number nine, David Reynolds. Total attendance this weekend, just over 41,000 people. So nice work, everybody at the bend. It's great to see so much passionate support in South Australia. A lot of people have come across from Victoria as well. Here we go. Peel off this time. And he exits turn 18 for Jamie Wincup just before he reaches Jack LeBrock and there's no traffic effect. And then they require an ultra-efficient stop at Red Bull. And in he goes. So he dances it right on the nose all the way to the 40 kilometre an hour control line. So this is going to be very interesting. Four tyres fuel on the tear off. Need you to go through uh, around the autobahn boom for us, please, mate. Around the autobahn boom. Square in the square in the Slade and Reynolds in also. Roll across. Roll across now, please, mate. Square in the box on the mark. Ooh. That was a nice amount of brake lock, wasn't it? Right on the mark, all locked up. Same with Dave. Nice stop. So they needed about 74 litres in rough math for car number one. Mark Winterbottom's the new leader of the race. David Reynolds car serviced as well. And you can see Tim Slade in the background of the freight liner car. So wind cup out and done. And very tight between Slade and Van Gisbergen. second margin over Jamie Winkup. Sorry, I sold your pup there, Neil. I thought yep. it was going to be much closer than that. The margin between the two teammates. Yeah. So that gap is going to be, in reality, it's almost nine seconds at the moment. It'll come down just a fraction from that when this just stabilises, but I thought it was going to be much, much closer. Rihanna? 
Yeah, as suspected by your beady eyes, guys, it was a drive shaft failure that has ended Lee Holdsworth's day. And we know where it is. <laughs> you do know where it is. So uh, that's an unusual failure. And uh, it's rattled out onto the middle of the main straight and then just neatly tumbled off to the side. And, um, fortunately, Lee was able to park that car off and the components been removed safely as well. Thanks again to all of the volunteer officials out here this weekend. Hundreds of them come out this weekend and given up their time to make a highly efficient race meeting for us and we thank you wherever you're working in the precinct. Crusoe's got back on to Lowndes now. So he cleared Stanaway and he's got right back up to the back of Craig Lowndes. And he's had good pace, Neil, hasn't he? We saw that mistake he made before. Once that, well, he's recovering from the traffic effect because yeah. he's tangled up with Stanaway. So yeah. here we go, Garth Tander off the road here, unfortunately. Now, he's down in about 20th position. Was he given a helping hand or has he just speared off on his own? That's down at turn 10. He'll rejoin over on the entry to turn 12. There's GTs. That's fast. The mid-corner speed at that section is about 195 kilometres an hour. So was that on the run to 10? 10, yep. Wow, that's very well wide of the mark. Paulie Jones, one of the two wildcard entries here this weekend, the Drill Pro car number four. We'll see him in action in the Pertec Enduro Cup. It's his second run this year in the main game. Felt for this young man when he had a couple of victories stitched up at the Dunlop Super 2 race at Townsville just recently. And they had dual shock absorber failures day on day, which is a, very much a rarity. Obviously, it's pretty harsh over the curbing up at Townsville. And, uh, knocked the wind out of his sails and certainly hurt his championship. But he's done quite a nice job so far this weekend. He's currently sitting in 20th. He's behind Jack LeBrock and in front of Garth Tander, who we just saw doing his best Russell Coit impression out in the weeds. I just walked up earlier this weekend to Wally Story, who was one of your old engineers. And I said, well, give me a greybeard version of what this track's like. He said, I think it's fantastic. Because he likes the technicality of it. He likes the smoothness. He likes the way it's got everyone scratching their heads. He's a very funny guy. He's done a really good job with Macro over the course of the weekend. Had to put up with you for all those years, so no wonder he's good. No wonder he lost a bit of hair, too. <laughs> it is a big challenge. Uh, I've seen more furrowed brows in the engineering groups this weekend than we've seen for a while, and uh, the prediction early in the week of people battling to stay on the road was uh, highly accurate. Shane Van Gisbergen said as soon as he saw it, there'll be a few people have a bit of a battle here. And, it was right. What was interesting, though, was the way in which it converted to the race yesterday and almost went the other way, where everybody went into conservation mode to make sure that they got home and got some points. Here's Nick Perkett, position number seven at the moment. He's tucked in behind fellow South Australian Scott Pike. Uh, those guys at the moment are around about, around about 25 seconds from the lead, and the lead is Mark Winterbottom. So you've got to take 10 of those seconds away when Frosty comes into the corrected leader, Jamie Winkup. There's been some good moves strategically and from a car pace perspective through the course of the day. Dave Reynolds is up seven spots. Perkat up eight. Will Davison up eight. Mostert up ten. And Mark Winterbottom at the moment because he hasn't finished his stop law. It'd be interesting with Mark because he put a lot of fuel on board. In fact, the most of the field, he had 81 litres for the first stop. So he's leading at the moment, but he hasn't done the second stop. He's only got roughly 40 litres to put on. And give you a feel for where he is. There's Brett Jones looking on, and his cars collectively was Slade, Perkat, even Blanchard and young McCauley Jones have actually been quite strong all weekend, haven't they? They've had a good weekend. Yeah. And uh, they've needed, they've had some tough ones. So Slade's the best place at the moment in position number four. Nick is in position number seven. Tim Blanchard's in 18th and McCauley's in 20th. So that's the picture for Brad Jones Racing. Brake temps down on the bottom right-hand side of screen as well. So uh, you can see the amount of cool-out that also occurs around here, particularly on the front straight on the run down to Turn 1. The temps drop enormously. You can see the enormous difference between the front and the rear. I may mention on the grid also the tiny little technical variation of the front brake rotor this weekend just in preparation for the Pertec Enduro Cup, and Bathurst in particular, which everybody knows is particularly brutal on brakes. 
One of the really hard things to manage at Bathurst is the enormous difference, or the delta as it's described by engineers, between peak values and the bottom value of the temperature and the cool out on Mountain Strait and Conrod Strait. So there's a bit of preparation going on in the background because those endurance races are knocking. They'll be very, very soon. Our next one coming up at Sandown in several weeks. And we'll go from 26 drivers to 52. Things will get very interesting down there once you add even further kilometres to 500 of them. Those numbers are interesting, aren't they? Because, as you said, there's a big disparity between the front brake temperature and the rear, but the cycling of the brake temperature and how efficient the brake is is very different through the course of a lap like this. And that's why you see so many of the drivers changing the brake bias, front and rear, in accordance with trying to make the brake performance as linear from a driver's perspective as you can possibly make it. Larko? Guys, just made a little observation down on the pit lane. You know, we wonder why teams win championships and drivers win races. And so much of it is down here. Just look at the marks on here. So this is Tickford Racing, and I'm not having a shot at anyone, but I'm going to walk to the other end. Look where those marks are relative to the tape. Look at the different lines coming out of the pit lane. Now, we're going to hustle along a little bit. Here we go, another set of marks. Look at the blackness, the lockups relative to the typing mark. Keep coming along. Look at these marks here. All different lines lines coming out of the pit bay and offside to one side. When I come to Jamie's, look at this. Dave, just come back here and have a look at this. Bang in the middle. Now, that pit stop he did before, I was watching it carefully. He was right on his markers here, but I'd never noticed how accurate he was, looking at these marks at every stop, him and Shane, so he's the same bay. Bang, square in the middle. That helps the guy here with the fuel hoses right at exactly the same length. I can hear you guys giggling. This is very interesting stuff, but I'm really impressed with the way he gets away on the same line every time. And it's that detail, because when they get out there, it's often won or lost by a second. That was a long walk. I'm puffed. I'll sit down and have a rest. <laughs> good job, Larko. <laughs> Very good. Uh, and that's the one percenters. All the tiny little things that add together. And just moving the conversation back again to the endurance races. If you want to win those really highly complex endurance races, those one percenters become ultra critical. This little battle continues between Pi and Percat at the moment. And they're Ooh. now starting to exchange vinyl. And Percat, does he get down the inside? No. He'll get down here. He's got a little bit of extra pace, but he's got to be able to apply it cleanly. So they're into turn six now. So in fact, he's just given him a bit of a helping hand that time. So Percat is now on the wrong side, though, when they start to run down the hill. If he can clear him, he can oh, close off. Good he has. Job. But does he turn it? Will it turn? Yep. <laughs> well done. That was a great exchange. These two guys got a bit of history, too, haven't they, from the DBS? from our Super 2 category, the development series. They battled through the course of that championship. And that was a great exchange. Bit of bumpy coming out of three, then a little bump down at turn six, then a little nudge over the top of the hill, and a brave turn in over the, the top of the rise by Percat. Got clear of Scott Pye. Percat now up into sixth spot. That's going to be fifth when Mark Winterbottom makes his Second stop. There's the bump. We used to call it rubbing paint. You're saying rubbing vinyl now. That's right. Well, the cars are wrapped, <laughs> so you've got to modify. You've got to be modern in your description. <laughs> Thank you. So, so Percat's up nine spots as a result of his charge. David Reynolds impressively up seven spots, and those guys in the top ten now. So Reynolds currently in fifth, Percat uh, in sixth, and as you said, when Frosty comes in and takes that second stop, they get an extra positional bonus. So more on the replay now. For uh, the this is where it started. Yeah, so Scott Pye ran slightly wide down there at one and then needed to cover when they got to three. And this is where Nick tried to sneak it up the inside. It's a hard place to do it because you end up on the wrong side of the road at turn five. And that's where we rejoined them right at that point as we're in our live coverage. And then he fires it back up the inside here. And there's a little bit of contact. Just there. But then I wasn't sure whether he'd get away with this one because from out wide, there's a, a lot more dirt and debris on the road. Actually, he in, did a good job. He did a very good job. And it, <laughs> in that process, uh, Scott Pye actually fanned the throttle as he well. Did. He did. What's what I was saying, he did a good job. I reckon Scott Pye could have escorted him straight off the road then. It would have been within his rights. So he actually came out of the throttle and avoided the contact. Percat got around the outside with a nice move, but... Scott Pye played a very big role in making sure that that was safely done. 
13 laps remaining and we're still seeing drivers setting personal best times. So Anton Di Pasquale's just done a 51.5. Fabian Coulthard has just done a 51.4. Cam Waters has done a 51.4. So Coulthard up into 15th position. So McLaughlin, he's uh, he's going to, at the moment, he's 12th. He's going to come up to 11th when Winterbottom makes his second stop. So even in terms of strategy, they made three spots before the stops. So through the course of today's strategy, he's actually dropped. He started 10th. He's going to be 11th. He's actually dropped a position. The other guy, uh, just looking at those winners and losers that you're speaking of, um, that's slightly snuck under the radar in his games has been Will Davison. So I spoke to him on the grid and they qualified down the order, but he's up uh, eight spots. So he's inside the top 10 now as well. So that's a nice recovery. It's interesting watching all of these people going through the rise and fall all the time. Well, to your point, when Winterbottom makes his stop, Will Davison's going to be the lead Falcon. Yeah. And I, I doubt whether you would have been able to sell that concept to him pre-race. No. On board here, Simona. Just putting some pressure on young Todd Hazelwood, who's in a new car this weekend. It's the car that he ran in the development series last year, the VF Commodore. They've announced through Matchstone Racing that they'll be going to a new ZB Commodore next year as a triple eight built car. A little bit of a weird time to change over, but they thought that was the right plan in terms of getting organized for 2019. Simone is putting pressure on Todd there, they're currently down in 24th and 25th position. So when Winterbottom does his stop, it's going to leave Winkup, Van Gisberg and Slade, Reynolds, Perkat, Pye, Davison. Now Win Winterbottom in now. So this is effectively going to give us the proper order. And he's Cup's going to have roughly 10 seconds lead over Van Giersbergen. Simona down the inside, nice move. He's frosty. Now he will make the shortest stop. This is roughly 40 litres to go on. Five seconds, Paul. Five seconds. Almost there, 10 seconds. Almost there, frosty. Get ready. Go, go, go. All clear. Thank you, boys. So he'd take an 80 plus in his first stop. So it has played him up the order a bit. But, uh, been a tough day for him. So, and there's Rick Kelly who was on the podium yesterday. We heard Rihanna, I think, mentioned a little bit earlier that they had a gear shifting drama with that car. So 24 hours later, Rick Kelly's having a real battle after claiming his fourth podium yesterday. No joy there. So Frosty's dropped back into 17th. He started at 17. So, yeah. Nothing from nothing. You work all day. Yeah. <laughs> work all day, don't you? It's a tough game. So there's your points. So Van Giersbergen will become the new leader by 25 points to McLaughlin. Remember, McLaughlin come into the weekend 89 points ahead as the leader. So what a weekend it's been for Van Giersbergen. Pretty ordinary day for Scott. Giesberger who drove so well yesterday. He's very good at finding the grip threshold and understanding how to get the best from the car. He and Grant McPherson work very well together. There you go, on cue. Alongside him there is David Couch and just in behind there is Mark Dutton. Jamie, 1.8, 10 laps to go. Slade, 1 1.3. So the last time that Shane Van Gisbergen was leading the championship was off the back of race seven. And that was down at Simmons Plains in Tasmania. So there he is. And here we go, Cunham 17. So that's uh, 11th position at the moment for Scott McLaughlin. So tricky times for the Shelby Power Racing. Yeah, very tricky times, Ryan Story. I don't think you would have ever thought that coming here this weekend, you would have left with a 
five-point deficit in the championship to Shane Gisberg. It's been heading in the wrong direction lately, but uh, we just need to dig deep and work harder. We, we haven't done a good enough job this weekend. The guys next door have absolutely smashed us, so uh, we've, got a, we've got quite a bit of work to do, but uh, the Enduros are a bit of a reset for us, and we're looking forward to them. Can you just give us a little bit of an insight into, you know, why you think, really, this car has not worked here this weekend, the challenges that you've been trying to get on top of? What's the synopsis? Well, it's, it's interesting. When we had the test day at the start of the year with the hard tyre, we really struggled to turn it on. And just to, just really struggling to get the rear tyre to work, and then when we bolted the softs on, we were we were right up there at the start of the year. So it was a bit of an indication that, uh, that we struggled a little bit with the hard tyre on a super smooth surface, and we just haven't been able to overcome it. We've been chasing it all weekend. Your car, though, has predominantly been very good. You watch um, Scott McLaughlin, how accurate he can be with the front of the car. I mean, we know he's a very special driver. Has he? The way you set the car up, has he been carrying just probably that that balance? And this this weekend, it's it's been exaggerated. Well, I think so to a, to, an, to an extent. He likes a, he likes a loose car, and uh, I think the unpredictable nature of the technical aspects of the circuit have, have caught us out a little bit. And uh, that's really what we've been chasing all weekend: is trying to get the balance right and get the tyres working for us. And uh, we just we haven't got them. You can easily turn around and stand down. I mean, uh, it's a, it's a very very different situation that we're going to face when we start the Pertig Endurance Cup in three weeks' time. That's, that's right. I mean, this is this this weekend's basically uh, the, the toughest weekend we've had for the for the year so far. But uh, we've we've had really good consistency up until now. So uh, we just need to need to get back on it and uh, and, and work on these longer races and uh, do the best we can. Thanks, mate. Thanks for the update. Thank you. Well, Murph was catching up with Ryan's story there. Shane Van Giersbergen went on to set a new lap record. 50.6 on the last lap. Still 8.7 seconds away from Jamie Winkup, but that's a very fast time. One of the things that's interesting me about the weekend, following on from the conversation that Greg was just having with Ryan, is that normally with the top teams, they ultimately find a solution somewhere, and maybe a little too little too late, but there's a bit of progress perhaps by this stage on Sunday at the end of the weekend. But you go back to practice one, you find McLaughlin in 18th. In practice two, he was 12th. In uh, practice three, he was 12th. There's the warning signs, and then it really didn't get any better, did it? So in qualifying for car number 17, probably a little bit of improvement up into fifth, and then uh, come the, the race uh, yesterday, you know, drop down the order again, and then it's really converted into another difficult day to day. So, they and they will have thrown many, many solutions at it, and none of them have worked. So that'll be really frustrating. They'll go through that in great detail as so we have a look at the Jack LeBrock and Tim Blanchard moment down at turn one. That was awkward, and it's resulted in Blanchard copping a whack down there and running wide. So, you know, a little, a reasonable little recovery yesterday with a, a sixth placing uh, for. McLaughlin in race number 22, but nothing like the standard we come to expect. And, uh, and I'm sure they're painfully aware of it down there. So Anton Di Pasquale and Carter the 99 here in a battle with Chaz Mostert. These fellas are arguing over 12th and 13th. Mostert's done a good job. He's up 11 spots. So Percat, Dave Reynolds up 8, Percat up 10, Davison up 9, Mostert up 11. The real loss for the day is Rick Kelly. He's down eight positions. Tim Slade just went a bit wide there a second ago. But he's, where is he? He's, uh, he's fourth. He's lost the spot from uh, Dave Reynolds there because we were hearing from Grant McPherson that it was Slade behind Shane Van Giersbergen. So he's gone off the podium with that mistake. Let's have a look. Locks the brake, runs it away, can't get it stopped, turns it in right out sideways, can't stay, just stays on the runoff road. So it stays on the black stuff, but it was a big, big mistake. And as you can see there, there's Dave, that chain up in front, right out sideways, stays on the tar, but it's the runoff road, and there goes Dave. Free kick. So that was down at turn one, and under investigation that moment we saw between car number 19 and 21. So they'll have a look at that in Cam's race control and resolve how they might deal with it. Now that brings David Reynolds up on the podium and that's a pretty impressive recovery for them today. They'll be uh, happy with that as a turnaround. So when you stop and look where David's name was in qualifying back there in 12th, and I spoke to him on the grid, uh, that's a nice turnaround. So up nine positions for David Reynolds. Let's get to Mark Larkin. 
I'm here with Mark Dunn. He's just putting his headset on to get his ears warm again. Sorry, mate, I said to Roland Dane earlier this morning, for me, this has been some of your finest work, your team, this weekend. But what was interesting to me, Shane Van Gisbergen paid credit to yours and Roland's leadership and the ability to manage the three cars and the difficult setup circumstances we've talked about this weekend. You must be very, very happy, Mark, with the way it's going here. Yeah, I, I think Shane's being generous to me anyway. I, I credit it to the engineers and the drivers working together, the crew preparing the cars. Uh, we're, we're a three-car team, so uh, everyone's learnt of each other. We share everything, and it's it's excellent at any track, let alone new circuit. We love coming to new circuits and uh, and having the results that Touchwood uh, will uh, finalise today. But Dado, we often talk about there's multi-car teams down the pit lane that don't necessarily do that well, uh, and I guess the point is, and there was so much chat about Ludo going, Going next door and all the rest of it. I look around here, it's the same familiar faces, and you've rebounded with great results. And that's the bit I think you should be very proud of. Oh, we are proud. Obviously, we can't comment on, on how other people do it. We try and and, uh, and include everyone in, in what we do. We take ideas from the workshop floor, from uh, from Mario the chef, mate. Everyone has input at Triple Eight. Can you switch the soft tyre on at the next race? Like you've switched this one on here today. And I hate saying switching on, but you know what I mean. We'll turn on, mate. We're good at that. <laughs> Can you tell me where the switch no, we'll is, like uh, we, we like Sandown. It's a great track. Uh, Jamie's had excellent uh, results there in the past. So is Craig. Shane, uh, Shane goes very quick there as well. So uh, Enduros, we love them. We like to, to step up a notch when we get to endurance season. So fingers crossed we can. Anyway, credit where credit's due, mate. Great job. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Laka, you can you tell us where that switch is? We talked about it earlier today. Just for everyone at home, there is no switch on the dash. You can't switch tyres on. So the language we want to use is putting tyres in the zone. Tyres up to temperature, not switching them on or off. That's Formula One we go, sorry. No, that's good. I just wanted to clarify that. I just didn't know where the switch was, that's all. So Wind Cup Van Duisburg and Reynolds, we had a glimpse there inside oh. the Erebus garage. Who are we riding with? <laughs> I don't know. It's Looks wild. Scott McLaughlin just gained a spot. I know that. Maybe it's Courtney, is it? Or is who is it? Yeah. OK, so that was James Courtney well and truly in the weeds out there. And uh, that's cost him dearly. A lot of time lost out there. So run very wide. I presume that was down in that Turn 10 area again. With a very high-speed approach down there. So looking at Jamie Winkup on screen here at the moment. He'll team up with Paul Dumbrell at Sandown, the Pertec Enduro Cup, and Paul's been keeping his eye in in Dunlop Super 2, as he has been in recent years, and successfully. Shane Van Gisbergen in car number 97 is going to team up with Earl Bamber, and that's a formidable combination. And he had some laps in the car earlier in the year, and there they are watching inside the Ripple Holden Racing Team. Alex Premier will be with Scott McLaughlin again at Shelby Power Racing. Nine seconds is the gap between Wind Cup and Van Gisbergen, so... He did most of that damage in the early sequence, Jamie Wincup. So I begged the question earlier in the day, would he be able to convert? Because yesterday he got stung, got away well off the line, and then had to yield down at turn six. And when the safety car came out, that really gifted, well, not gifted because he worked really hard for it, but it helped cement the position for Shane Van Gisbergen and it took Wincup out of the play. But today he's come back with a better car and, and he hasn't even looked like missing a beat. Totally. Been a dominant display, beautiful start. Beautiful qualifying. There's the points now. So that little move with Courtney going off the road and McLaughlin getting a free kick has brought that point barrier back from 25 to 19. And across the weekend, it's now a 108-point gain that Van Gisbergen has made. So we've still got five laps remaining. McLaughlin will be pressing on as hard as he can. He's got Caruso and Lowndes right in front of him. So Wink up Van Gisbergen, Reynolds, Slade, Percat, Pye, Davison, Lowndes, Caruso, McLaughlin. There he is. A young man who's driven so well all year. He's been the qualifying benchmark. 11 poles. He's had seven wins. But they've lost momentum. It's one of the things in this game. You can just tell even by the demeanour. He's been critical with the way he's driven the car this weekend. Ludo and the team, we just spoke to Ryan Story a little while ago, Ludo and the team haven't been able to make this tyre work, this car perform to their liking on this surface. So it's been a tough change around and a real momentum shift in the championship. So his last victory is on Saturday at Queensland Raceway. I was just about to talk up the stocks of uh, Chaz Mostert because he's made steady progress this afternoon, up 11 positions, but a wild moment for him on the replay at turn 13 hours because of the dirt. Yeah. So it actually wasn't his fault. 
there was a load of gravel deposited about half a second before he arrived there. So that made life tricky. Anton Di Pasquale was the preceding car. So not on the podium at all yesterday for McLaughlin. He was on the podium in Sydney in third position. But remember, he had that big battle and lost out with Shane Van Gisbergen. A couple of podiums at Queensland, at Queen, Queensland race one. And uh, you're right, though, there's been a little momentum shift, haven't there? I think it's gone in both directions. Not only has the hard tyre been problematic for Shell Deep Power Racing this weekend, but at Red Bull, they're continuing to find more and more speed with their cars and their challenge in the early part of the year. And I put it directly on Roland Dane's nose at Darwin in the post-race interview. What do you need? He said, we've got to fix qualifying. When they jumped out after Darwin and we turned up in Townsville, that's exactly what they did. They immediately responded uh, with a poll on the Sunday. And they've been slowly but surely able to improve the tunability of those cars. So as they've found more confidence and applied more pressure, there's been an equal and opposite effect next door. Just uh, looking at the lap times, boys, and uh, the fluctuations, even the guys at the front, Jamie Wincups, uh, Shane Van Gisbergen, uh, David Reynolds, just some of the lap times they're doing, and then the following lap, the difference could be four, five, six, seven tenths. Just quickly with uh, Grant McPherson talking about it, he said you should see some of the, the data inputs on the, the, the telemetry that they're getting through there and, and how many moments that the guys are having. So one lap they're going around, it seems all nice and smooth, then someone's gone off the road. And the difference it makes when you arrive there and just the, the lap time spread that they're getting from it. Because I was looking and going, are they trying hard? And he said, well, they are trying, but they're also trying really, really hard to keep these things on the track some of the times. And you can see that just with the fluctuation. It's uh, quite bizarre. We don't see that very often. I think the dirt's having a bit of an effect yeah. in that process, but 100%. The other thing that's weird uh, is that the gap between last lap and their fastest lap is far, far tighter than we typically see. So sure. I'm watching yeah. those quite carefully all the time just to see how the race is trending. And uh, the leading group at the moment are in the second sector of the racetrack, but I'll refresh those numbers when they complete their lap and I'll give you an idea that the difference between their peak lap and their current lap is, is nothing like what it would be. Well, in the last lap, 50.6 is the fastest lap of the race. New lap record chain Van Gisberg on a lap 32. On the last lap, he did a 50.68. So 800 slower. Yeah. So um, the tyre is just not wearing and degrading as it would normally do. So uh, in behind Craig Lowndes at the moment is Michael Caruso, the industrial athlete Nissan. We're looking at him inside the cockpit on the right-hand side of screen. Comparative data to understand the way in which the two cars are behaving and the guys are driving them. They're sitting at the moment in eighth and ninth position. So, to illustrate the point, Lowndes' last lap was a 51-1-4. His best lap, a 51-1-2. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, so, for Caruso, 51-5. His best was a 50.9. There's a bigger variance there. Now... For Shane Van Gisbergen, uh, he had last lap it was a 50.7, his best was a 50.6. It's crazy. They'll be looking at the dashboard on occasion. You've probably been through this as well. Sometimes when it doesn't shift very much, you begin to worry whether or not the data's it's broken. Whether it's broken, you give it a tap. Like a, a rotten old cheap stopwatch. Is there something wrong with it? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> the gap now between Wink Cup and Van Gisbergen is 8 point one second further four and a half seconds back to dave reynolds and further 5.3 seconds back just going back to greg's Tim point Slade. a ago that wind from the southwest has actually picked up pretty significantly as well that'll be a little bit of the reason why there's all of a sudden a few mistakes creeping in because the car behavior will be a bit different here and there and it'll be bringing more dirt on yeah. a couple of places yeah not dealing with the sunlight yesterday afternoon if you were with us beautiful clear skies and sunlight in the late afternoon, into a couple go. of the corners. The car behind. Very difficult to view the apex in the corner properly. That was David Couchy on the phone. That's David on the right, on the phone to Jamie Winkup. Smooth and consistent was the message, which is exactly what he's been today. His jump off the line was as good as I've seen in terms of reaction time. And then he walked away with an early gap. He put a little bit more fuel on at the first stop. He then had to stop for less time at the second stop compared to the, ma the majority of the protagonists, especially Shane Van Gisbergen. And then since then, he left 
the second stop with roughly a big slide there. You can see he's still working it pretty hard. He left that second stop with about nine and a half seconds lead. It's now 7.7 with only two laps remaining. No doubt at all that he was pretty stung not grabbing a podium yesterday. It's not often, particularly when you've got a decent car, that uh, you start on pole position and you don't get a cup for your trouble. Yeah. And a fourth place for him yesterday, and it doesn't look like the same mistake would be made twice. So he's in very commanding position at the moment. It's almost an eight second margin. We still hear tire chatter in the background late in the day. Making the run down now to turn 17 for him. Came into the weekend. 455 races tagged against Jamie Wincup's name. Picked off another one yesterday. Pretty, pretty amazing innings, hasn't it? He's still only 35 years of age, but he's been such a fixture in the paddock now. He could be forgiven for thinking that uh, he's an older guy with seven championship victories to his name. There's the margin. You heard it on the radio in the background. He's at the all-time number of wins. Second in that queue is Craig Lowndes. Pretty much converted 25% in round terms of his starts into victories. That's his uncle on the left-hand side of the screen. So uh, that's a pretty impressive number against Jamie's name. Been adding pole positions this weekend as well. And uh, coming good at the time of the year where you need to because, and, and this has been the forte for he and Paul Dumbrell to sand down at Bathurst and the Gold Coast. That's where they've done a lot of damage. And so when we had those provisional points up a little bit earlier, he, he's sneaking back into the game here. I know early on you, you thought you were worried that he was going to be out of the game. It may not turn out to be the case. He could be a real pest in the back end of the year and, and well and truly get in amongst those championship players, Shane Van Gisbergen and Scott McLaughlin. Yeah, for sure. I mean, as you said, 79 pole positions. This will be his 112th win if he's able to stay on the island for the remaining lap. And as you said, it's been a marvellous career and he's especially good when he leads. I, I often say that he's very much like Peter Brock when he gets off the line and was able to lead the race. He rarely makes a mistake. He's done it again today with a faultless display. Very good team strategy also. They they cut it right to the edge, didn't they, with the Caruso rejoin. That was right on the edge. Scott Pye, that group. Here we go. So coming up now to the final corner for Jamie Wincup. He squares it up. He's done a huge job in South Australia. Jamie Wincup, victory number four in 2018 and career win 1-1-2. Good job, Dad. Thank you. That was awesome. Nice work. And a monstrous margin. 11.2 seconds in the end. David Reynolds actually got quite close to the back of Shane Van Gisbergen. What's he pointing out for? That's a great job by David Reynolds and everybody at Penrite. That Erebus team can take a lot of pride in that performance to have come back from where they qualified in 12th to make up those positions. That is a mighty performance, and that plays David Reynolds back in with a bit of positive spin when he needed it, because he's been a little bit like McLaughlin of late. There's just been that feeling that the tide's gone slightly out. Totally. It's rolling, congratulating all of the team, and this is a massive team effort from Red Bull Holden Racing Team to have dominated the weekend. The win yesterday for Van Gisbergen, the win today for Jamie. As you can see there, there's our podium. And as you said, Dave Reynolds, for me, he's been the man of the match because to come from 12th and really be pretty much lost in terms of car setup, they made some changes. The car was far better. Their strategy was good. Alistair McBain called the right shots and Dave drove it very well. A little mistake there late for Tim Slade. Took him off the podium. And this man, McLaughlin, who started 10th, finished 10th, is now 19 points adrift in the championship for 2018. So I'm staggered by the margin in the end. We'll check it out on the results board now. 11.2 seconds. Now, clearly, Shane just rolled out of it at the back end of it. But uh, very good pace shown by Wincup to completely smash the field this afternoon in race number 23, the OTR Super Sprint. He's an ambassador for the location. so. 
an ambassadorial role that served him well. He obviously will like this place because he goes home with the biggest of trophies and 150 points to his credit from Van Gisberg. And then David Reynolds spoken about what an awesome job he's done this afternoon. A shame for Tim Slade where a podium was potentially on, but that mistake at turn one cruel that notion. Nick Percat in fifth, looking further afield. Anton Di Pasquale, nice recovery today to be just outside the top 10. Uh, James Courtney in there as well. Chaz Mostert, noteworthy too, given where he qualified. That's a big climb back, so they can take some consolation from that. Kirk Kostecki went out very early. So did Andre Heimgartner when he slammed into the back of Garth Tander. And we saw Componentry Park Company from Lee Holdsworth's car, and he's finished there in 26th. So this one's all about Wind Cup. So not only does Van Gisbergen now inherit the championship lead, but Jamie Wincup is closing in on everybody as well at a fairly significant rate. So this is going to make things pretty interesting as we get to the Pertec Enduro Cup. Big reaction from the crowd. Had an enormous number of people come out from Adelaide, across from Victoria and from the local region. And into the Virgin Australia victory lane comes Jamie Wincup. So two Red Bulls, one and two. That's the way they started on the front row of the grid. Jamie grabs moves his tally this year onto four, as I said before. His teammate Shane Van Gisbergen with six wins this year. He's only one adrift now from Scotty McLaughlin. Mark Dutton jumps into the party as well. David Reynolds gets in there, and uh, that'll be great relief for David. He nice. had a big smile, didn't he? Yeah, he good on him. And, uh, yeah, he's a good guy, he's a great character. And I'm just quickly scanning back through, I think the last podium for David was back in Darwin in car number nine. I'll just verify that, but that's a, a nice bit of work. So in fact, it was, it was race 16 in the Northern Territory. So tremendous performance for Jamie Wincup. He grabs the gold today. Jamie Wincup back in the Virgin Australia victory lane. You were pretty gutted after yesterday's effort. Pretty awesome win today. Yeah, great to uh, come back after yesterday, but um, Big thanks to all the engineers at, at, at Red Bull. Uh, they worked hard before the event to, to get the cars quick and then just uh, worked together tirelessly throughout the weekend to, to make sure we had two fast cars. And um, Yeah, great to come over the one-two. Pretty amazing effort by your team. A brand new circuit. You're the ambassador for the circuit and you guys have absolutely dominated this weekend. Yeah, uh, hey, all credit. I know I know it's cliche, but full credit to the team. We've uh, They've worked hard behind the scene, given us two rockets and uh, us two wallies kept it on the track most of the time. So, uh, yeah, fantastic weekend. No doubt you enjoy the celebrations for this one. Shane Van Gisbergen. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Shane, will come over to your car. Walk over here with me. Jane, congratulations. It's been a pretty successful weekend for you as well, and you are now the championship leader. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. I saw the purple board, got a bit excited, but such a long way to go. We need to keep our heads down, but um, credit to the team. Red Bull Holden Racing team have given us some rockets this weekend. One, two. That's really special, but um, long way to go. We've got to keep focused, but uh, we're in a good spot. I can tell you're a happy man. Enjoy the celebrations. On the podium, Dave Reynolds, you told me earlier that it's been an abysmal weekend for you, but you have made your way onto the podium from 12th on the grid, an outstanding job. Uh, yeah, mega job by the Erebus Penrock crew. Everyone should be really happy. You know, uh, we got on the setup just probably a little bit too late, but if we had that at the start of the weekend, might have been a better result. But uh, no, very, very happy. Everything went smoothly then, and uh, it was great. It's, been a hard, it's a hard little track, very hard little track. It's been a bit of a lean run for results of you lately. This must mean, this must mean be pretty special for you. <laughs> yeah, it's a great result. Um, even though we started, we didn't qualify the best. We've, we qualified 12th, you know, running up to third behind the two uh, 888 cars. It's a, it's a, you know, mega tick in the box for us. I can tell it means a lot. You're a little bit exhausted, Dave. <laughs> I need some water. Gartando, I'm uh, surprised you didn't get done for speeding in pit lane because I think you flew over the line probably uh, way faster than what you should have. That was a massive impact. I think we're going to have a replay of that in a second. Yeah, maybe if the whole car's in the air, the sensors don't pick it up. Man, it hits so hard. It actually, it's done something to my back and my neck. It hit that hard. So, um, yeah, look, I don't know. What do you do? That's twice in a row, two races in a row. He did the same to me in Sydney, drilled the back of me and... That is massive, absolutely massive impact. After that, obviously your body, but uh, the rest of the car, she can't. And then uh, we saw the exit as well, uh, which um, just added to the pain and suffering. Lots of carnage there. The back of your car is in very poor shape. It can't have been too good in the handling department after that, I wouldn't have thought. No, nah, we lost all the rear arrows, so the car was um, 
car was really good in the mid, slow and mid-speed stuff, but out the back there in, a, in 7, 8, 9, 10, it was, had no rear arrow, so no rear grip. And, um, you had a big excursion there yeah, at one stage. Yeah, so I went and mowed the lawn for the Shaheens, and um, yeah, tough race, because I thought we had a, you know, we got a good start, good first lap. I thought the strategy was going to be right. Just some Muppet drove in the back of us. Thanks, mate. Cheers. So let's have a look now at the points situation after 23 of 31 races in the Virgin Australia Supercars Championship. A new leader for the first time since Tasmania. Shane Van Gisbergen grabs the lead again. He's got a tiny margin of just 19 points. A lot more pressure now on McLaughlin as we go into the Pertec Enduro Cup. Jamie Woodcup is just 362 points behind, remembering their 300-point weekends, for example, at Sandown and Bathurst. Craig Lowndes, minus 549. Reynolds, then Fabian Coulthard. Rick Kelly in position number seven from Chas Mostert. Tim Slade, pretty unlucky today to miss out on a podium, followed by Scott Pye, who's inside the top ten. So a very successful weekend for everybody at Tail and Bend. It's been christened now at a major level with supercars competition of 120 kilometres yesterday, 200 kilometres today. And I think everybody will leave here tonight having enjoyed some pretty impressive motor racing. There's been an enormous amount of money spent and work done in the last couple of years at this location. Don't forget, we'd like to encourage you to jump onto the Supercars website, supercars.com, and let us know who your top performer is. So jump online and let us know who's done a great job today. I'll put a vote in right now and suggest that David Reynolds has done a mighty job today together with his team. The strategy that they played in the first segment of the race was very, very impressive. So recapping those results for you, Win Cup over Van Gisbergen, Red Bull 1 and 2, they started that way off the front row of the grid, but David Reynolds up nine positions to finish in position number three, then Tim Slade looking very red at the top end of town because it was Win Cup, Van Gisbergen, Reynolds, Slade, Percat and Pye, the top six cars were Holden's. Will Davison was the first of the Falcons, followed by Craig Lowndes, when you stop and consider where Lowndes started yesterday afternoon's race. It's also been a reasonable turnaround for him this weekend. Michael Crusoe got on the podium yesterday, but has ended up in ninth position today. Scott McLaughlin down in 10th. So they'll be lamenting that, and that's something to contemplate in debrief. And they'll need to pull it apart in great detail as they cannot afford for the slump to continue as we head into the races at Sandown, at Bathurst, and at the Gold Coast. It's been a very big day. It's time now to celebrate. Race 23 of the season, 200 kilometres here at the Bend, 41 laps. Fantastic racing through the pack. And it's third place today for Erebus Penrite Racing and David Reynolds. <laughs> With the third place trophy today, Simon Ruddick, head of brand for On The Run. Runner up today and your new version Australia Championship leader from the Red Bull Holden Racing Team, it's Shane Van Gisbergen. And with the trophy for second place today, the managing director of the Bend Motorsport Park himself, Sam Shaheen. A strong one, two today for the Red Bull Holden Racing Team and representing the winning team, it's Chris Goose. Australia with the team's representative trophy. <laughs> A commanding performance from Red Bull all weekend and your winning driver today for the Red Bull Holden Racing Team, it's Jamie Winkup. <laughs> and the Honourable David Ridgway representing the Premier of South Australia with the winner's trophy. here from the OTR Super Sprint. Congratulations to the three on the podium. Let's go to the Enduros.